may we truly sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his words. If only we would do that constantly, then we'd be in a better position because we'd be understanding what he has to offer us. The journey is short. Time is measured in several ways. Could be measured in seconds, in minutes, in hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, or whatever. Whether we believe it or not, the clock is ticking and it is necessary to our everyday life. We refer to it several times each day. And it is common to hear comments like, time is going fast. The year has only just begun. But guess what? Already, we are approaching the last two days of February. Very soon, it will be spring, then summer. And we're back to preparing for the fall and winter. What is happening? Is time slipping away from us? Could we hold it back? Could we speed it up? Let us pray. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Father, we wait on you for a word. Speak to us, we ask through Christ's sake. Amen. Soon we'll be referring to a specific occasion as before or after COVID. Why? because the period of COVID is significant. Don't tell me that you don't know of someone who has tasted of that dreaded disease. Not long ago, only in late 2019 or by February, March of 2020, we heard of COVID-19, which was then foreign to us, but which seemed as if it would not necessarily grace our shores. However, we started to be cautious. How it took on global proportions so rapidly is still a mystery to us. We find ourselves encountering mandates upon mandates and guidelines. The world has been plunged into chaos again and again. Doesn't Matthew 24, 6 to 8 give us a glimpse into the chaos that we see existing in our world today. We shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, well read by Sister Thorpe. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. And in verse eight, it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. All this traces back to obedience versus disobedience, which is at the core of our very existence. Ever since there was war in heaven, when then Lucifer concocted the idea that God is unfair and he influenced and encouraged the angelic host, so consider there has been chaos. And I'm going to refer to this again later in the sermon. We have chaos in the government. Chaos at the workplace. Can you remember any chaos in, in the government? Chaotic situations. Can you remember any at the workplace? In the workplace, it may be a power struggle. In the government, it may be a power struggle. That's, that is interesting. Chaos in the family. It may not be power in the family. It may be selfishness or something else. Chaos in the church. Why? It could be power. It could be that you're not satisfied with something. It could be that somebody said something that you did, did not like. 
chaos even when we are at play. And you know many games can end in conflicts. Chaos in a road rage. I don't need to explain that. Chaos among some passengers. I'm hearing that on some flights, we've had chaos. Why? Some people refuse to wear the mask. Some people are touching others. We will, we will touch on that. Even in a simple flight from one city to another, we can have chaos. Impatience, selfishness, greed, envy, hatred, strife, and the list goes on and on. Why do we get ourselves in pointless arguments and competitions, leaving us depressed and wretched when it's all so short? Life is so short. The game itself is short. Good sportsmanship suggests that when two teams are competing, one will definitely win. Why then get angry when you lose? Isn't time short? There will likely be another opportunity to do better. Our domestic affairs are not worth getting so angry over that risk a heart attack. Let me, let's look at the window of Abraham and Lot. Then Abraham, he had cattle and together they had lots of possessions between them and they couldn't dwell in the same area so genesis 13 helps us to, to see what happened verse 7 of genesis 13 says and there was a strife between the herdmen of abram's cattle and the herdmen of lot's cattle and the canaanite and the perizzite dwelled then in the land and abram said unto lot let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere. Where the, That's before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even it was so watered, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot the east and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Abram had no, no time for strife. Do you need to know what later happened to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? Let's skip. Galatians 5. Let's hear of some of the negatives that affect us. Galatians 5, we're reading from verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So what should we do? This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. You know what that is? 
I prefer it's a person, a, a, a manner or a gesture, a feeling or revealing an overt and often offensive sexual desire. So somebody, somebody could say he gave her a lascivious wink and, and, and that is common. Many people know of that. Let's continue. Verse 20 talks about idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, variances, inconsistency, and emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, the list goes on, drunkenness, revelings, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not, I repeat, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is God's word. But let's go look at the flip side now. Verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And here's, a, here's caution. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or envying one another. Do you notice how the devil seeks to have a parallel to most things that are of the Lord? Firstly, he coveted the Lord for the homage paid him. Worship is due to God alone. And so the devil has come up with a parallel worship. Today, there's even satanic worship. Music is transformed to praising him instead of the Lord. The concept that a dead person is still alive is what he told Eve in the garden. He alluded to that. She would not surely die. Now, Hollywood has taken that baton and has brought it to the youngest child that a creature can continue to show life even after death. Speaking to the dead as King Saul disguised himself and the witch of Endor to do is prominent in many beliefs. Let's go back to, to the war in heaven because it began with an angel named Lucifer who was described as a covering cherub. You know what that is? Ezekiel 28 describes him. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And listen to this. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. But my question to you, you know what a covering cherub is? Exodus 25 gives us a look at that. Now, Moses was directed to make a sanctuary. And in the sanctuary, he was also told, thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Exodus 25, reading from verse 14. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. Now, here it is, verse 19. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. Verse 20. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims. Now, 
We therefore understand that a covering cherub is an angel that stood in the very presence of God, covering the ark of the testimony in which lay the law of God. Above the ark was God's mercy seat. These earthly replicas, these earthly replicas were designed to teach heavenly realities. And Hebrews 8, 1 to 5 helps us to understand that even better. So this image shows us the foundation of God's throne, the mercy seat. In heaven was his law, the Ark of the Covenant, and Lucifer was once an angel that stood closest to the throne of God, covering, meaning to guard or protect the law of God. This was his position in heaven. All was at peace until iniquity was found in Lucifer. According to 1 John 3 verse 4, iniquity or sin is defined as whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Why? For sin is the transgression of the law. Lucifer, the angel that was to guard the law of God, the foundation of God's government, turned against that very law, which resulted in the introduction of sin into the heavenly atmosphere. So, hence, the first war was over the law of God. Lucifer, like a master politician, argued that heavenly angels had no need for a law because they were already holy. Lucifer said, I will be like the most high without obeying his laws. In other words, Lucifer, now Satan, had introduced the principle of self-righteousness. Righteousness by one's own standard versus the universal standard of God's law. The argument was a deceptive one and one that still deceives the masses today. Many can be heard repeating the lie that we do not need to obey God in order to be like God. Even in Christian circles, the lesson is taught that God's law is obsolete and one need not obey to be like him in character. Just as a great multitude of heavenly angels fell for Satan's lie, so millions of people carry the same philosophy and therefore place themselves in rank with the forces of Satan. Remember, Adam and Eve were told the same lie. You can be like gods without obeying God. They fell for it. As a result, humanity became rebels of the kingdom of heaven. For to be carnally minded, says Romans chapter 8, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But listen to this. God introduced the plan of salvation, a plan to design that design was designed to lead mankind back to the throne of God through obedience to his law. This is the plan of salvation. And all who stand for the government of God place themselves squarely against Satan and his army. And the dragon, according to Revelation 12, was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is the dividing line between those who will be loyal subjects of the throne of heaven and those who refuse to acknowledge and strive to live by God's law. Hence, John wrote, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's 1 John 2 verse 4. It is evidence of being in a covenant relationship with God. A covenant Paul describes in, in these words in Hebrews 10. This is the covenant 
that I'll make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. The prophet Daniel recognized this division of forces. He wrote, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That's Daniel 11, verse 33. Yes, as Lucifer flattered the angels in heaven with the thought that they were naturally good, so he seeks to flatter people today. And we fall for it. And we think we have a lot of time, but our journey is short. The people that do know their God will not be fooled or deceived but will do mighty things for God and for the redemption of many. This is anonymous. An elderly woman got on a bus and sat down. At the next stop, a strong, grumpy young lady climbed up and sat down beside the old woman, hitting her with her numerous bags. Can you relate to that? When she saw that the elderly woman remained silent, listen to this, the young woman asked her why she had not complained when she hit her with her bags. The elder woman, elderly woman replied with a smile, there is no need to be rude or, dis or discuss something so insignificant as our journey together is so short because I'm going to get off at the next stop. Let's face it. Why would she have a, a long discussion? She's getting off at the next stop. Her journey is short. This answer is classic. There is no need to discuss something so insignificant because our journey together is too short. You see, saints, time is too short for conflicts. The Russian invasion on Ukraine is nothing to measure with what the world is to be plunged into in the not too distant future. And by the way, we need to pray for peace in those regions and ask God to help. Again, time is short. We have no time to delay as we prepare for the final conflict of good against evil. Where is your allegiance? Listen to this quote from the pen of Ellen White. The power of the Holy Ghost must be upon us and the captain of the Lord's host will stand at the head of the angels of heaven to direct the battle. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Two opposing powers, two great opposing powers are revealed in the last great battle, on one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his commands. On the other side stands the prince of darkness with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. The present is a fearful time for the church. Angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour out their vials of wrath upon the world. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance for the spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them under his banner for war. Satan is to make most powerful efforts for the mastery in the last great conflict. Fundamental principles will be brought out and the decisions made in regard to them. Ungodliness abounds. The faith of individual members of the church will be tested as though there were not another person in the world. So what do we need to study the pouring out of these vials the powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle 
But don't be afraid. Providence has a part to act in the battle. When the earth is lighted with the glory of the angel, the righteous elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. And I close with a quote from Acts of the Apostles. It's paragraph 507.2. What the church needs in these last days of peril is an army of workers who, like Paul, have educated themselves for usefulness, who have a deep experience in the things of God, and who are filled with earnestness and zeal. Sanctified, self-sacrificing men are needed. Men who will not shun trial and responsibility. Men who are brave and true. Men in whose hearts Christ is formed, the hope of glory, and who with lips touched with the holy fire will preach God's word. For want of such workers, the cause of God languishes, and fatal errors like a deadly poison taint the morals and blight the hopes of a large part of the human race. Friends, Come on board. Christ is depending on you to come on board. Choose him today. If for some reason you are convinced that you can be a part of God's believing group, put in the chat that give us the details that we can contact you. We can pray for you. If for some reason you're touched by something said today, and you would like further information, put it in the chat. We will try to get back to you. Let it be that your position is not on the line. It's either for Christ or against Christ. There are only two positions. Time is going. Time is short. And in such a short time, we are enveloped by the pandemic. And the whole world, in a short time, experienced the same thing. What next? Do you know? What next? Something else can come. It doesn't have to be health-directed. It doesn't have to be. It can be something else. It can be food. It can be anything else. It can be just individuals going, going out of work. But let it be that you are found on the Lord's side. Let's bow our heads for prayer. We thank you, God, for your words. We thank you for the privilege that we have to call you our Father. We thank you that you extend your invitation to us to join you in the struggle against good and evil. It started in heaven. It continues on earth. And because the devil has a short time, he is mustering all his forces. But Lord, we are thankful that with you, we are safe. Help us to join you. Help us to remain with you. Help us never to move, but to stand tall for you. And the youth of our nation, we call on you because you are strong. Join God's forces today and stand up for him. Let not the devil plague you. God has better plans for you. And as we end this worship experience, Lord, please accept every word and let it be to your name's honor and glory, we pray through Christ's sake. Amen.